Good evening, America. It is 7 p.m. Monday, August 17th, and this is Queer News Tonight, the world's first live LGBTQ daily evening news. It is time to queer up the news. So watch as we bring you these and other stories from the LGBTQ headlines. Tonight, we bring you a special interview with Trump ally Roger Stone, which will air at the end of our show tonight. So be sure to stick around. The effort to rebuild Beirut with pride through fundraising begins. And Detroit Archbishop bans LGBTQ Catholic groups, offers conversion therapy instead. On It's Happening Out this Wednesday at 8 p.m., we are going to choose between three very attractive gay men's groups on our fantastic Shag Mary Chop. And this Thursday at 8 p.m., participate as America's host live on Gay Town Hall, a discussion of the biggest LGBTQ topics of interest of the week with the largest collection of diversity of hosts ever. So good evening again, America. It is 7 p.m. Monday, August 17, 2020, and it is time to queer up the news. We are literally out of the closet and into the headlines. So many of your stories we are going to tell this evening on Queer News Tonight. Tonight on the world's first live daily queer evening news show. Tonight's news about the gay community and the news from an LGBTQ perspective. Are our gay stories important to you? In headlines, politics, entertainment, gay culture, travel, religion, and more. Reported by respected anchors. Out of the closet and into the headlines on Q News Tonight. Well, thank you for joining Queer News tonight. We are live. This is an unedited news show, so anything can happen. And we're kind of hoping it does tonight. You'll find <laughs> out why in a moment. This evening, we bring you the news of and a perspective from the LGBTQ community. I'm your anchor, Al Ferguson, and this is my co-anchors, Aaron Dar and Chef Josie. Let's queer up the news. Tonight we begin with queer headlines. The LGBTQ community in America is diverse. The LGBTQ community around the world is vast, and we bring you the bullet points of queer news for today, Monday, August 17th, 2020. Let's begin by queering up Vote 2020. The LGBTQ lineup hits the Democratic National Convention this week. Watch this. Most of the convention's prominent speakers will give their remarks virtually. Former First Lady Michelle Obama will speak tomorrow night. Former President Bill Clinton will speak Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, it is former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and former President Barack Obama. Former Vice President Joe Biden will accept his nomination for the presidency on Thursday. State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta from Philadelphia will give the keynote address on Tuesday night. He is the first openly gay person of color to serve in the General Assembly. The 2020 Democratic National Convention, a four-day event where the Democratic Party formally nominates its presidential and vice presidential candidates and major Democrats speak about the party's future, starts tonight in Milwaukee. The event will feature several LGBTQ people, including Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin, former Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and Virginia delegate Danica Rome. And it's being organized by former human rights campaign president Joe Salamanese. Baldwin is scheduled to speak on Thursday night. In 2012, she became the first out LGBTQ person ever elected to the U.S. Senate and the first woman Wisconsin has sent to the Senate. The convention comes at a time where over 50% of voters report uh, that prefer Biden say they are voting more against Trump than for Biden. Well, I'll tell you as someone who's very involved with the Democratic Party, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Joe Biden was probably one of my last choices in the Democratic primary for president, but since he's picked Kamala Harris as his vice president, he's actually uh, gone up 19 percentage points uh, amongst people from 18 to 29, up 8% with uh, black voters, and up 7% 
with Hispanic voters. So we're seeing a bump from Kamala Harris. First 48 hours, he raised over $48 million. And they're well on track by the end of this week to raise another $25 million. I think Democrats are energized around Biden-Harris. Well, it looks like the Democratic Party are not the only ones, are actually IHO, it's happening out, are not the only ones queering up the news. Uh, it looks like the Democratic Party is following our lead and queering up the uh, Democratic National Convention. We are going to follow this week very, very closely. We're going to report uh, to LGBT America everything uh, that becomes important, uh, what happens in the next four days that affects the LGBT community which is just about everything. Well, from the road to the White House to the road to Stonewall, new documentary explores how America declassified homosexuality as a mental illness. Watch this. If you were gay in those days, you were diagnosed as suffering from a mental disorder. Like so many people in my generation, I went to psychoanalysis to be cured. These are some of the methods doctors employ to cure homosexuality. Electroshock therapy, hysterectomies on lesbians, castrations of gay men. People use psychiatry as a reason to discriminate. Apart from the discrimination against us, it gave us a horrible image of ourselves. As our viewers just saw, a new documentary cured is due to make its debut at the virtual edition of Outfest Los Angeles on August 24th. Cured will explore how the American Psychiatric Association finally declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder in 1973, something which an eyewitness in the documentary calls the most important moment in gay liberation history. The documentary also examines methods used to try and cure people of their queerness as well as the role that John E. Fryer, the first American psychiatrist to come out as gay, played in the movement. I'm looking forward to this film, and it's, it's still very sad that we're still having this conversation so many years after the fact. 1973 was just one year before I was born. So we're talking, almost, well, let's not talk about that. Uh, fantastic that an LGBT film festival helps document the struggles in our community and the progress forward. I would also mention that Happening Out Television and Queer News Tonight are major sponsors of uh, Outshine Film Festival that is going getting ready next week to begin here in South Florida, and we're going to tell you a lot more about that. You know, I also think it's really important to note uh, the history of where we've come and where we are today. We are the LGBTQ community. Together, we stand strong when we stand for each other. You know, homosexuality may have been declassified as a mental illness in 1973, but around many circles in America and all over the world, people who identify as transgender are still given that same sentiment that they are suffering from a mental disorder, which you and I both know is the furthest thing from the truth. Next, we're going to queer up the world. LGBTQ rights are flashpoint in culture war dividing Europe's East and West. Watch this. One third of Poland has adopted the controversial anti-LGBT ideology resolution after many disagreements partner cities have started to end their cooperation with Polish LGBT free towns. The EU has sent letters asking local councils whether the European funds were spent on discriminatory projects and threatened to withdraw funds if so. Dominic Sora is an LGBT activist from Puławy. Two European partner cities cut ties with his hometown of Puławy. He decided to act and send them a message. I stuck cards with the words we will miss you on the emblems of Neuwaj and Dwajzu to show it is simply a loss. Last year, this small Polish town near the eastern edge of the European Union passed a resolution proclaiming itself a muni municipality free of LGBT ideology. Last month, the EU responded by stripping funding for a program connecting Tuchau with a sister city in France. EU authorities say Tuchau had violated a fundamental right not to be discriminated against based on sexual orientation or gender, something protected in the bloc's treaties and high court case law. 
politicians in the in nations of the East that had been behind the Iron Curtain in the course of the Cold War current themselves as defending traditions and Christian values. For many in the West, that strategy is at odds with elementary tenets of Western liberal democracy. Well, I honestly think uh, it's good news that the EU is starting to stand up to some of these smaller towns. And ultimately, this is going to become a conflict between the EU and uh, President Duda's re-election in Poland. There's a clash coming, and this division between Western uh, Europe and Eastern Europe reminds me very much of the clash that's going on in, the Mer in America between northern states uh, in COVID and southern states. It's a very similar situation. You know, we've reported on this story just last week around uh, uh, homosexuality in Poland, for example, and EU perhaps really uh, flaming the, the fuel, the fires, if you will, and, and making sure that uh, Poland is a, a safe and, and welcoming area and, and part of the region for LGBTQ people. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. You have to hit people where it hurts. We're stronger together than we are divided. We continue uh, in queuing up entertainment uh, in reporting that the Hallmark Channel featured Network's first same-sex wedding in a new film. Less than a year after facing backlash for pulling ads that featured two brides kissing at the altar, the Hallmark Channel showcased its first ever same-sex union in a movie that aired Friday. Wedding Every Weekend, starring Kimberly Sustad and Paul Campbell, follows two single friends who agree to attend four weddings over the course of four weeks, together as wedding buddies, to avoid being set up with other single attendees. One of the weddings included the union of a same-sex couple, Vicky and Amanda. The trailer shows the two brides joyfully raising their clasped hands in the air at the altar, although it does not show the couple kiss. The Hallmark Channel is following in the footsteps of Lifetime, which announced its first upcoming holiday films centered on LGBTQ romance and a Chinese-American family. Next, we continue to queer up gay culture. Founder of Gay Times magazine, Chris Graham Bell, passes away. Chris launched the magazine in 1974 when the rights of gay men and women were still being hard fought for, and in doing that, he played a significant part in getting their voices heard. He was refused a business loan by a leading high street bank for being gay, and the business suffered repeated police raids. Chris was a very private man and would not have wanted to inform or burden people with the problems he encountered surrounding his health in recent years. He died peacefully in his sleep. And everyone in America and at, at, at Happening Out Television Network, and especially here at Queer News Tonight, mark this trailblazer of our community. And you will be missed. Next, let's queer up religion. Detroit Archbishop bans LGBTQ Catholic groups, offers conversion therapy instead. The Catholic Archdiocese of Detroit has banned two LGBTQ groups from gathering at churches and having mass performed and is instead recommending a form of conversion therapy that treats sexuality like addiction. Dignity Detroit, which has offered space for LGBTQ Catholics to exercise their faith for more than 45 years, and Fortunate Families Detroit, a six-year-old support group for LGBTQ families, received letters from Auxiliary Bishop Gerard Battersby telling them they would no longer be allowed in the Archdiocese. Battersby said the ban on LGBTQ groups was to prevent confusing the faithful by seeming to endorse an alternative and contradictory path to sanctity. Mm -hmm. Frank Damore, president of Dignity Detroit, aid Battersby sudden reversal in support for the groups made no sense given it has operated for more than four decades. Mm. We queer up the world in reporting China's oldest pride organization announces an indefinite hiatus and cancels events. China's oldest pride organization, Shanghai Pride, has announced that it is canceling all events and taking a break from scheduling future ones. The organization has been running since 2009. In a statement on their website titled The End of the Rainbow, they wrote, 
Shanghai Pride began in 2009 as a small community event in celebration of acceptance and diversity. Over the past 12 years, we worked hard to enrich the culture and diversity of this city that we love so much. We showcased inspired artwork, theater, and films. We fostered connections through job fairs and group open days. We offered a platform for individuals to share authentic stories about their lives. We threw parties that brought people together, and we hosted forums to trade wisdom on how to make Shanghai a more vibrant, inclusive place. Mm. Queer News Tonight sends salute to the entire LGBTQ community of Shanghai and really all of China. We continue to queer up the world. Effort to rebuild Beirut with pride through fundraising begins. Led by a group of LGBTQ Lebanese expats and allies, an event has been set up to raise relief funds for those impacted by the recent Beirut blast. Taking place on Saturday, August 22nd, the socially distanced event will go ahead at the Bell Pub in Whitechapel. Packed with an evening of live performances, art, and drag, it's all been put together to show support for Beirut, its people, and its reconstruction. All proceeds raised during the fundraiser will be donated to four selected local charities, including a campaign to help trans and non-binary residents impacted by the blast. Hmm. Next, let's queer up the USA. We're still 20 years away from seeing an openly LGBTQ president in the White House, claims Barney Frank. The former congressman and civil rights campaigner told Reuters that attitudes towards the LGBTQ community have changed significantly since he was first elected to Congress as a closeted gay, uh, closeted gay man in 1981. Frank, who came out in 1987, said that LGBTQ plus equality is closer than ever before, but he still doesn't think a queer person will be in the Oval Office for another 20 years. The country has made it very clear, full legal equality wins and prejudice loses, the 80-year-old said. However, trans rights are lagging behind, he admitted, referring specifically to Trump's much maligned trans military ban, which he announced in a series of tweets in 2017. Hmm. Next, let's catch up on all the news surrounding COVID-19 with our segment called Quarantine Quickies. The first story tonight is our daily reporting of coronavirus facts, especially important to the LGBTQ community. First, we report on coronavirus case numbers. Based on standard acceptance of 7% population of the LGBTQ community, the world's LGBTQ COVID-19 cases stand at 1,533,491, while America's LGBTQ COVID-19 cases stand at 390,143. We remind you that America continues to be ground zero of the pandemic. The USA is just 4.4% of the world's population, and today America is 25.4% of all of the cases in the world. Next, we report on coronavirus deaths. The world's LGBTQ COVID-19 deaths stand now at a staggering 54,218, while America's LGBTQ COVID-19 deaths stand at 12,123. The USA is 22.3% of all of the world's deaths. Next on Quarantine Quickies, LGBTQ elders face a serious health threat in President Donald Trump. Watch this. Once again, Trump and Pence are trying to take away our rights. Only this time, it's a direct attack on the health care of LGBTQ people. Here's the long version. They're interpreting Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act to remove explicit protections for LGBTQ people in health care programs and activities by eliminating explicit protections from discrimination based on sex stereotyping and gender identity. Here's the short version. It's discrimination. With this proposed regulation, Trump and Pence threaten to undermine crucial protections for LGBTQ people under the Affordable Care Act. LGBTQ Americans across the country are in a critical moment as they face the impacts of a dual health system and political crisis in the age of both COVID-19 and the Trump administration. The devastating effects of the intersection of these two crises on older LGBTQ individuals are happening in a profound 
way, desperately calling for our community to reimagine how we take care of our elders. LGBTQ elders are depending on all of us to step up the commitment we've made to them and we remain dedicated to fulfilling that promise now more than ever. And Donald Trump must be opposed every step of the way. Yeah, let's not lose track of the, of the important part of this, and that is the wellness and the well-being of our elderly community. Um, we're all going to get there at some point, and you can, it says a lot about a society, how we treat our children and our elderly. You know, it's a, a fresh reminder. Uh, more than 25% of all of the deaths in America are over the age of 65 years old. And this story reminds us that the LGBT community is as vulnerable as the general population. So it's a reminder that we must make sure that we take precaution. And that will ensure that we wear a mask and we socially distance when we're going out uh, to the social events that younger LGBT are participating in. Well, I have to tell you, I firmly believe, and I always have, and I always will, that you can judge a nation based off of how they care for their children and their elders. And right now, America uh, is quite shameful under the Trump administration, which especially amidst a pandemic, keeps advocating for, this administration keeps advocating for slashing uh, health care, Social Security, Medicare, uh, we can do so much better. I remain absolutely concerned and committed to fighting for our LGBTQ elders and all of our elders in any way possible. Next with Quarantine Quickies. Gay lawmaker and COVID-19 survivor tried to donate plasma to help others, but he was turned away because of his sexuality. Watch this. I just want to donate my plasma. By all accounts, State Representative Chevron Jones would be a perfect candidate to donate potentially life-saving plasma. He is, after all, a COVID-19 survivor. But he was denied when he tried donating on Friday after he answered yes to the screening question, have you had sex with a man in the past three months? Dehumanizing is, a, is, is an understatement. In 2020, this is something that we're that we're still battling. The ban on gay and bisexual men donating blood or plasma dates back to the 1980s during the HIV AIDS epidemic. Chevron Jones, a Democratic member of the Florida House of Representatives, went to a blood drive on August 7th with his mother, Blaneva Jones, and his father, Eric Jones. The three decided to donate blood because they had recently recovered from COVID-19 and wanted to help others by donating their antibody-rich blood. Writing on Twitter, Jones said, I was blessed to get through COVID, and it's only right that we bless someone else and give them a fighting chance to live. But Jones' dreams were quickly crushed when he was turned away by One Blood because of a government policy that requires queer men to practice celibacy for three months before donating blood. In April, more than 500 doctors and experts in the United States wrote to the FDA, urging them to overturn the scientifically outdated ban. It's interesting when you have social issues like the LGBT community and, and the reason uh, that anti-LGBT policy was created uh, intersects and clashes with a pandemic, we still choose the social isolation of, in this instance, gay men over the needs of responding to the pandemic. It is old fashioned thinking. Uh, well, you know, for our viewers who may not be familiar with South Florida politics, uh, I have to say, Chevin Jones, uh, when he was elected two years ago in 2018, became the first African American out gay man elected uh, to the state legislature in Florida, which is something to be very proud of. He currently is running for the state Senate in an open seat against probably one of the most homophobic. Uh, candidates that we've seen that just last week was endorsed by the Christian Family Coalition in Miami-Dade mm -hmm. County, a recommendation that she herself saw that uh, goes and puts forth notions that uh, conversion therapy is okay and what have you. Uh, you know, I think elections have consequences and uh, for our South Florida voters out there, I encourage them to vote for Chevron Jones on August 18th. Chevron, you're going to be able to serve our city, our country, and your community uh, with more than just your blood. So thank you for at least trying. 
Well, next we queer up our segment called Good News. After we finish our headlines, we want to report on something that made us smile today in Good News. So as we clear up Good News, Oklahoma boy gets 5,000 adoption inquiries in 12 hours after a heartbreaking interview in which he pleaded for a family. A nine-year-old boy named Jordan stole all of our hearts here at Q News tonight when he pleaded for a family to call his own. And the public has responded in grand fashion. So watch this. You could go anywhere, anywhere in the whole wide world. Where would it be? To an adoption party for a home. And if you were granted three wishes? Family, family, those are only wishes I have. It's no secret a family would be a dream come true. Jordan lives at a group home now, but would love a sense of normalcy and the unconditional love of a parent. I call mom and dad, or this mom, or this dad. I don't really care. A family to eat mac and cheese together, ride bikes together, and most of all. Well, the reason why it's important is because um, so I could have um, some, like, some people to talk to anytime I need to. A child just looking for his place to call home. Lacey Lett, Oklahoma's News 4. Well, America, as you can tell, Happening Out Television Network is broadcasting on our brand new set in partnership with the Sunshine Cathedral, the world's largest queer church here in Fort Lauderdale, Wilton Manors, Florida. And we joke this is the gayest place on planet Earth. Our support of their Sunday celebration broadcast is the largest live LGBTQ religious broadcast in the entire world, every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, live. We encourage you to tune in. Sunshine Cathedral is my queer church. Watch this. Darrell Watkins, Senior Minister, Sunshine Cathedral is my queer church. So welcome Sunshine Cathedral and our partnership at Happening Out. We end tonight's broadcast with The Big Finish. These are short story mentions of LGBTQ news or news with a gay perspective. So here we go, first on Queer News Tonight's The Big Finish. Alex Morse, mayor and congressional LGBTQ candidate, tells everyone that he has sex. Listen, Alex Morse, uh, he's 31 years old. Uh, his students are over 18. They can legally, uh, you know, consent. They are adults. But uh, being that he is a mayor and he's running for Congress, he is guided by ethics. Uh, and there are consequences for him violating those ethics. So should he be elected to Congress, I seriously think he should reevaluate some of his personal behaviors. Hey, world, I'm here to tell you that I'm Chef Josie and I have sex, too. <laughs> and running for mayor. <laughs> right. And um, by the way, America, this may come as a shock to many Republicans who apparently do not know how their sons and daughters came into this world, given how they react to sex and evangelical pastors. <sighs> At least until they get caught with the rent boy. The Big Finish. The material girl turns 62. All hail Madonna. I'll tell you, you know, I'm 29 years old and I've seen all the pop divas. And to this day, Madonna has put on the best show, the best concert, the best tour I've ever seen in my life. So happy birthday, Madonna. We love you. Yeah, happy birthday, madam. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I'm lost for words here. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> We've been celebrating you my entire life. And for my friend, Kevin, who's not here tonight, 
happy, happy birthday, Mad. Right. And that's a ringing <laughs> endorsement because she's not even a gay man. <laughs> <laughs> the queen of pop feels like she's ageless to me. And she's been doing this music thing, are you ready? For longer than a lot of our audience has been alive. <gasps> but it would be nice <laughs> if she could show up to a concert on time when she visits oh. Florida next. <laughs> even with that read, what gay man doesn't get all tingly inside when you hear Madge say, Hello, girls! Do you, you believe, believe in love? Because I got something to say about it, and it goes like this. <laughs> oh, we are so gay. We oh, so yes. Gay. So finish. A restaurant in China apologizes after asking customers to weigh before ordering? You know, I have to ask myself every time I come here, is this an intervention or is this a newscast? What is this? Why am I here? You'll Who find am out I? You're going to find out in a moment. <laughs> well, I wish someone would weigh me before I ate, just so that I would be reminded that it's time for me to slim it down. Well, first, I don't know why they would bother. All of those hot dog eating contest <laughs> winners are skin and bones. Uh, you got to watch out for the skinny ones, too. Oh, and by the way, Aaron. How was your recent trip to China? <laughs> Makes me want a hot dog real, <laughs> real bad. <laughs> <laughs> the big finish. Ben Shapiro doesn't understand what a WAP is. <laughs> and Ben Shapiro also doesn't understand common sense or human reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I have to follow you on that one, Aaron. That's for sure. But just so you know, Ben Shapiro, it means wet ass pussy. <laughs> <laughs> or white american princess <laughs> see a little to the left of me a little to the right a jar is born I, right. I, I hate to say it i hate to say it but there is finally finally something that our chef josie for sure knows a lot more about than me other than cooking the big finish Voters in North Carolina have received absentee ballot request forms in the mail with Donald Trump's face on them? Yet again, this is another assault on our democracy, on our Constitution. I'm really calling on Republicans in Congress and Republicans in the U.S. Senate to put country before party. This is getting to where it is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. Somebody give him a glass of water. Yeah, hey, right. Hey, well, listen, if you thought the Black Lives Matter protests were something, keep up this, uh, this um, attack on our democracy, Trump. Keep attacking our, uh, our USP, uh, um, USP post Postal Service yes, and keep on uh, trying to block us from voting you out in November. Yeah, it's, he's not going to win. He's not going to work. I can't think of anything that would make me want to vote for Donald Trump. Trump less than seeing his face come out of my mailbox. Of course, North Carolina is no stranger to Republican dirty tricks relating to elections. Just saying. The big finish. America is number one. Did you hear? This week, <laughs> Death Valley was 130 degrees and was the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth. And as Bernie Sanders says, climate change is real. Ah, we got the big, the big banks. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess uh, Trump, you know, that, that, uh, that climate change is just another one of those democratic hoax. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think my fellow Republicans are right. We totally don't need to worry about climate change. 130 degree weather is very normal and won't have horrible effects on us. Unfortunately, client must be placed on the back burner. Why do you ask LGBTQ America? Well, there's, let's see, Trump, pandemic, the post office, Russia, Poland, oil tankers splitting in half, $7 trillion in debt, 40 million unemployed, one-tenth of 1% 1 of American billionaires have made 50% of all of the money in 2020. And then there is in the LGBT community, the loss of uh -huh. sex socialization in our gay communities, our bars are closed, and we have lost all of our events. Oh, and I can't remember. Did I mention Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. Yep, the ice cap is melting for sure. Mm. 
Well, that's our show. Tonight, we <laughs> present a special interview with notorious Trump ally, Roger Stone. Love him, or like I do, hate him. He is going to help <laughs> understand the motivation and thinking. Yes, Donald Trump thinks. The thinking of Donald Trump to vote for 2020. You are going to be especially surprised on what he says about the LGBTQ community. Tonight is part one as he talks about a gay president, Barry Goldwater wanting to keep government out of the bedroom, his tattoo of Nixon on his back, and other Republicans that will be added to make a Mount Rushmore of conservatives. He tells Al Ferguson that he is the only person Al has ever met with a dick in the front and a dick in the back. He talks about resilience and how the LGBTQ community embraces it. Stone reveals a sixth book is coming called A MAGA Martyr oh and tells about the chilling morning the FBI raid happens in the gayest place on planet Earth, including a Fort Lauderdale police tip-off, dozens of agents, and even frogman divers. He opens up on every detail about the Mueller and prosecutors, and he says they were like Captain Ahab looking for their white whale. Nothing is left off the table, and this is his first, his first in-depth major interview and first LGBTQ community interview in years. So watch this. Well, hello, America. It's Al Ferguson with the Happening Out Television Network, and we have a very special interview for you today, uh, and that is with Roger Stone. Now, an interesting interview, I think, uh, we're going to have with the LGBT community. Uh, Roger Stone is celebrating his fifth decade in politics. Uh, some call him notorious. Uh, he has created a substantial impact, uh, not only on conservative politics in America, but the country as a whole. Um, Mr. Stone, thank you for being with us here today. Delighted to be here. Can I call you Roger? Yes, you may. Yeah, that's great. Um, Makes me feel younger. Yes. Okay, good. Oh, it's one of the things we're going to talk about. Um, uh, you are first and foremost interesting to me because of all of your brand marketing. You seem to me to be very ahead of the curve. Uh, your free Roger Stone movement and uh, your Republican fingers uh, as, as you hold them up. Um, you have worked with the presidents in either campaigns or advising, uh, including Nixon, Reagan, Dole, Trump. That's a pretty impressive uh, resume in conservative politics. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I have had the luxury of supporting men and women for public office that I believed in. Early in my practice, I had to take anybody who walked in the door. I mean, political consulting is a very, very competitive business, it's become more and more competitive as more and more people who have no qualifications whatsoever have joined the field because it looks easy from the outside. But uh, um, I've had the luxury of helping support men and women whose fundamental beliefs I believed in. Well, we're going to talk about uh, a number of those situations. A lot of people in the LGBTQ um, uh, community probably do not know uh, that your, um, your lobbying um, organization in, uh, in Washington was with Paul Manafort, and uh, one of the most successful uh, in history. What was that experience uh, like, working with Paul Manafort? Well, after the 1980 Reagan election, um, Charlie Black and Paul Manafort and I <clears throat> all confronted the question of whether we wanted to go into government or whether we wanted to stay in private practice. Um, I had no interest in being in government because I had for a very brief time worked at the Office of Economic Opportunity under Don Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld was one of the many protégés of Richard Nixon. Nixon was a great believer in developing a bench. Um, he had a number of young protégés who he helped uh, get elected to Congress or the Senate or he in some cases appointed to office. Uh, which really became the future of the party. Rumsfeld was among them. Um, I'm not a fan of Rumsfeld's war policies, but that's another story. In any event, uh, Don Rumsfeld was sent over to the Office of Economic Opportunity, and I was sent over with him. I think I lasted six months. I'm not interested in the paperwork and the minutiae of government. My interest is in 
the mechanics of politics and how to use the mechanics of politics to elect men and women to offices where they can effectuate public policies uh, that I agree with. Hmm. Uh, let me make the connection to um, your your classic uh, Nixon pose with the, uh, your two arms up and the, the fingers. So your loyalty respect the re re reiteration of that uh, image is because Nixon taught the the training of develop a bench and then be loyal to the bench. Well, that's that's part of it, but it, it let's cut to the chase. Okay. Uh, as you know, I have uh, a, a tattoo of Richard Nixon. On I'm getting ready to ask you about it. That's We're going to put that up right now because the LGBT community is going to be shocked and fascinated. Well, first of all, it makes me the only person you know with a dick on the front <laughs> and the back. Uh, but the point of this is not even a political statement. It really isn't. Uh, the point of this is, uh, for me, a daily reminder that in life, when things don't go your way, when you get knocked down, when you suffer defeats, when you are discouraged, when you want to quit, when you think you're finished, that's the time you have to get up off the canvas and get back in the game. Uh, and the story of Nixon, uh, regardless of his politics, and his politics would be considered quite progressive by today's standards, uh, is a story of resilience. It's a story of persistence. It's really very much an American story. So if you ask me which president I philosophically and ideologically most align with, it wouldn't be Nixon. It would probably be Reagan. Uh, but, or maybe even Eisenhower. But uh, what I admire about Nixon is his personal resilience. That he comes back from defeat and after defeat uh, this is someone who was given nothing. This is someone who grew up dirt poor, put himself through college, put himself through law school, took on an improbable uh, house race where everyone said he couldn't win, spent uh, only uh, four years in the house. Recognize he went from being a lieutenant mustered out of the U.S. Navy to being vice president of the United States in six years. Four years in the house, two years in the Senate, onto the national ticket, and then on six national tickets. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an incredible accomplishment. And it's interesting to me, um, you talk about resilience. What, what's your reaction uh, when I say the LGBT community understands that conceptual uh, observation completely? Because our entire community is built on the resilience to remind yourself that you have to stand up over and over and over again. Yeah, I think it, I think it is. A, it's a lesson for everybody. Doesn't matter who you are. The 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 point, of course, is never quitting. Never quitting. Nixon, I think, said, "A man is not finished when he's defeated. He is only finished when he quits. Mm. Until one has been in the deepest valley, one cannot appreciate the majesty of the highest mountaintop." This is certainly true in my own career. I've had highs and lows. I've had victories and defeats. Uh, the key point is to never quit, to keep pursuing your goal, whatever that may be. Hmm. Um, before we move on to, uh, and I, I do want to talk a lot about uh, um, uh, the LGBT community and your embracement of it, but um, in this vein about having um, the tattoo uh, on your back and um, between your shoulder blades. I love the sound bite. You're the only man that I've ever met that has dicks both in the front and the back. Works at the dinners, I must tell you. I, I, it, the it blue haired Republican ladies kind of blush, but uh, it's a cross, it's a crowd stop. Um, I I read uh, and I saw a, an image of it recently or relatively recently. You got a second tattoo on your back. No, that's that's uh, untrue. That is not true. That is okay. Not true. So I, let's debunk it right now. Uh, I have thought about having adding uh, Barry Goldwater, who really is the person who got me into politics, because he believed in individual personal freedom, the smallest, least intrusive government as possible. Government out of the boardroom, out of the bedroom. Do what you want. That's your right as an American. He hated uh, 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 surveillance by the government. He hated the whole concept of the erosion of our civil liberties. Uh, Reagan, uh, because uh, of his strength as president, rebuilding our economy, rebuilding respect for the country around the world. Uh, Nixon, who's already there, reached a strategic arms limitation agreement with the Soviets, opened the door to China. I think he'd be rolling in his grave if he knew how the Bushes and the Clintons were going to give the Chinese the key to the store. That's a different question. Ended the Vietnam War, 
ended the military draft for 18 year olds, gave us the 18 year old vote, desegregated the public schools without incident. When he became president, 82% of the American schools were still segregated. By the time he left, it was like in the 20s. Uh, the, uh, uh, the saving of, the, uh, of Israel unilaterally in the 1973 Yom Kippur War over the objection of his own chief of staff, of his own joint chiefs, of his own national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, uh, against all advice, he ships $37 million worth of lethal aid to the Israelis who have their backs against the sea uh, due to a surprise attack by the Egyptians and the Syrians. Hmm. Uh, the war on cancer. Uh, you know, his accomplishments Are really go on and on. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, you have uh, uh, Trump, who rebuilt our economy when everybody said it couldn't be done. People said, well, America's great days are behind you. You can no longer be a leader. These jobs are never coming back, and, and so on. So I would consider having a Mount Rushmore type effect on my back with all of them, except for it would hurt like hell. Yeah, and they, who would it be? Um, uh, it would be Goldwater, Reagan, and Trump. I would add them to Richard Nixon. Yeah, uh, so uh, your tattoo, you would turn into Mount Rushmore that's between the, your that's shoulders. That's the idea, but boy, it would take a quart of vodka. I yes, a, a quart. All right. Well, also a very good uh, LGBT embracement. I want to ask you specifically, before we move on um, uh, to some other issues, uh, you have the self-proclaimed title of the dirty trickster. Is that true? Yeah, no, I actually uh, I argue with that. I've never called myself oh that. it well, did not I, come out of your mouth no and okay. I actually got the LA Times to print a retraction because I got sick of it. it it is ubiquitous you can read every place in the last year self-proclaimed or set or, or self uh, uh, attributed I have attributed that others have called me that and therefore I'm stuck with it it's going to be in my obituary it's going to be on my tombstone there's not much I can do about it I will certainly admit to being a practitioner of hardball politics. This is America. Politics has always been hardball. Abraham Lincoln's opponents handed out flyers, a handbill, saying that he had fathered a, a multiracial child. Um, we had uh, one of our early presidents was reputed to be gay. They called him Nancy, and they handed out flyers about that. Hmm. So Which president? I think it was um, not Franklin Pierce, but... Uh, Millard Fillmore, I'm uncertain. Yeah. I, I can look it up, but it, it's an accurate reference. The point is, all that's changed is the method of delivery. We used to use handbills, now we use the internet. Now, that said, I don't think I've ever done anything that my contemporaries haven't done, and I'm prepared to do whatever's necessary to elect my candidate short of breaking the law. Now, one man's dirty trick is another man's civic participation. Mm. One man's dirty trickster is uh, another man's freedom fighter. In 1960, Robert Kennedy, somebody I admire, uh, and whose son I particularly admire, uh, and is a friend of mine, uh, in the 1960 West Virginia primary, sends anti-Catholic literature to every Catholic household in the state and makes it look like it came from Hubert Humphrey, their opponent. And the liberals think this is clever. How clever of them. Uh, if a Republican did that, or if I did that, oh, what a heinous, dirty trick. By the way, that was not illegal in 1960. It would be illegal today. So dirty tricks are even in the eye of the ball. All right, so you didn't say it. It was applied on you. Correct. You got a retraction from it. I, I wasn't sure about that. I'm stuck I'm, with it, I'm, whether I like it or not. I'm going to come back to the common ground observation you made uh, later in the interview. I want to talk about your books. I didn't realize um, uh, what a prolific author you are and, and writing. How many books have you written? I've written five books. Five. Uh, soon to be six. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, what's the book uh, that's in the works this now? This entire ordeal that I've been through um, has to be laid out because, incredibly, I was for 16 months under an unconstitutional gag order. Mm. So you're not allowed to defend yourself. Are you, you are not? Uh, uh, still. Today, today the gag order is removed. Okay. Uh, but for 16 months, CNN and MSNBC and the Washington Post particularly, which is dominant within the, the jurisdiction in which I was being tried, are literally raining shit on me on a daily basis, at least 80% of which is just incorrect, or their greatest trick, they omit key facts to create a false impression, 
Yet the judge rules, I am not entitled to respond to any of that and defend myself within the realm of any platform whatsoever. Not to a public meeting, not on a TV show, not on an interview with gay TV, n not on the internet, not on social media. Clearly unconstitutional. When I appealed that ruling, it went to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. They sat on it for five months, even though it was a very simple question. Uh, and then they ruled procedurally, I had to first ask the judge who imposed the gag order to remove it before it was appropriate for review by the circuit, which they could have ruled two days after I filed. And your, your and book... Then, by then it was trial time. Your book is going to outline all of this process of exactly what happened. It's going to outline the entire process of being hunted uh, for political reasons by the federal government. Because what happened to me where you le lose your voice, you lose your freedom of movement, you lose your home, your car, your insurance, because of the gags, your ability to make a month, uh, to make a living, uh, that can all, that can happen to any. If it can happen to me, it can happen to any American w with the blink of an eye. I want to mention later in the interview Mueller and um, and some of the written, the Attorney General's comment at the House Judiciary Committee, but but broadly, first off, do you have a title for the book yet? Uh, I do not. Yeah. Uh, working title would be a MAGA martyr. But um, I'm still open to suggestions. Yeah, and uh, publishing date approximately? Uh, after the election. Yeah, uh, definitely after the election. And it's, uh, it's interesting in terms of what you brought up in terms of the removal of the gag order. Uh, we're broadcasting right now this interview from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we joke in our shows that we're broadcasting in the gayest place on planet Earth. South Florida has one of the highest LGBT density populations in the United States. Um, the 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 pressure of uh, when the the federal government came in for the arrest, etc. Uh, when I watched that, and I and I watched CNN uh, covering it live, uh, and how they knew it was happening, I, <laughs> unclear. But well, I watched. Not really, it. we can get into that. Yeah, I I well, let's do that. Um, I and I watched it. But my f number one thing was, what was your reaction? Why all of that was going on? How did you feel? You're this libertarian and, 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 and what you've just outlined that you say well, you're going to explore in the book. I think it requires some background. Uh, so for almost two years, there was a drumbeat of leaks from the special counsel's office. Roger Stone will be indicted for treason, espionage, conspiracy against the United States, money laundering of millions of rubles into U.S. dollars in violation of the foreign campaign contributions ban, mail fraud, wire fraud, cyber crimes including unauthorized access to a computer, cyber crimes including the receipt and dissemination of stolen data, uh, aiding and abetting a conspiracy, accessory to a conspiracy after the fact. Uh, just a constant, Robert Mueller now has Roger Stone's IRS and banking records. How else could CNN know that but from a leak? Leaks are illegal from the special counsel. Uh, so I do endure two years of this, uh, and I counterpunched as best I could, because I certainly know there was no Russian collusion. I w knew that I had never received anything from WikiLeaks and passed it on, and that I had no n advanced knowledge of the source or content of what they were going to publish. I only knew that they were going to publish something in October that was significant, because Julian Assange said on CNN in June that he would do so. It's not a state secret. So um, it was perplexing because I was clearly uh, cognizant of the fact that 19 of my current and former associates had been dragged in front of the grand, grand jury and browbeat. Uh, and uh, this fellow, Aaron Zielinski, um, who I will file multiple complaints about because of his misconduct as a prosecutor, was kind of like Captain Ahab with the whale. In other words, where are the WikiLeaks documents? We know he has them. We know he's hiding them. Well, they, I, it's just not true. Uh, and despite this legal proctological examination that they gave me, poking into every corner of my life, they could find no evidence of any of those crimes whatsoever. So uh, I still felt that I would be charged, but I couldn't figure out what it was that I could be charged with. 
because I knew I was guilty of none of those crimes. By the end of uh, uh, 2018, this became a weekly drumbeat. Mother zeroes in on stone. Mother tightens the noose on stone. Mother totally focused on stone. Uh, and then on January 25th, uh, on January 24th, I got a phone call from a producer at CNN who said, um, I need your home address. I want to mail you something. I said, hmm, all right. Well, I gave her my home address, realizing that my home address could be found online fairly easily. But then when I went online and looked, I noticed that there were two addresses since I had fairly recently moved, and that may have caused some confusion. So I said to my wife, um, they're coming tomorrow morning to arrest me. And she said, you've been saying that for six months. I said, no, no, I'm pretty sure this is tomorrow. Still can't figure out what the charges might be, but uh, I do think we need to be prepared. So I set my alarm for 5 a.m. Uh, I got up, I took a shower. I put on one of my Roger Stone did nothing wrong t-shirts. Uh, and I sat in an upstairs bathroom window where you could see the entire front yard. Uh, at about uh, 5.45, my cell phone rang. It was a member of the Fort Lauderdale Police Department who just happens to be a friend. And he said, uh, hey, what are you doing? I said, uh, I'm kind of waiting. Why? He said, well, I'm over at Starbucks. And there must be 30 FBI agents here getting coffee, and the drift I get is they're headed to your house. And I said, well, I've been expecting 